Plus, he can hit it. Like, I've been on the other side of his forehand. Yeah, yeah. He can exactly. hit the ball. Yeah, he can crush it at times. But here's the thing. And it, again, good. this – but it looks good. Yeah, In yeah. terms of, like, this is what I'm saying. Like, he's hitting the right – you know, technically, is it, it, it's okay. But it's like the serve. He's not throwing the arm at it. Yeah, his so body's every, locked. He's not throwing it. There's no like separation in the arm and in, in anything. You know, the, the, the kinetic chain just stops at the shoulder, very similar to the serve. You know what? I think that it's, it stops actually a lot earlier. Just like the, um, he was throwing the shoulder at the serve earlier, I think it actually, if you, if you look at it, he uses his feet, he uses his legs to to thrust his entire body into a rotation of the shot, you see? Yep. So it's kind of locked all the way from the hip up his shot. You know, his, his legs have powered this massive turn. Yeah. And then his good timing, you know, allows him to hit a really nice shot. But in reality, like if you look, his body is traveling at the exact same speed around, you know, so no body part works off of, the previous one, just like on. I always struggle to connect the hips to fire the the body, right? So when I told him to turn the hips first, like you say, he's just kind of jumping the whole thing around. Yeah. There's no sequence through the hips and into the shoulders or to the torso, right? So he's always found it difficult to be like, all right, how do I initiate the hips? And to Chain. Because what we're saying is you start with the feet, then the legs, then the hips turn, and then the torso, the shoulders, and then the elbow and you know the, 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 the hand coming through. Right. So you're saying it just starts with the legs. Stops. The whole body just turns, which creates a little bit of momentum, and the arm is connected to it all. So it's just one big right. drag. You know, it's exactly. It's like right taking... Around. It's like taking a, you know, a, however many pounds he weighs, taking a statue and rotating it from the base, it's going to hit the ball pretty hard. Yeah. Right? But if you have all these other rotations happen within the statue, the ball is going to be flying. At them. For anyone watching this, like the best way to develop this kinetic chain, in my experience, is to throw the ball. Because if you're talking about, okay, so my hips have to turn, then this has to move, then this has to move. The kinetic, the kinetic chain is so refined and has to happen in such a timely manner that if you're thinking about it too much, it can be pretty hard, especially when it's not natural. So what I end up doing is to think about it as a, as a throwing motion. Because when you do this, if you notice here, like the hips turn, but the legs haven't moved with it, right? So the hips are turning. That's allowing the space for the arm to move, the elbow leads, and then you can, can release it. So one thing I did with him is to get him to do this. Here, you can see, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit awkward. He's doing a bit extreme, but you can see how the hips turn, which releases the arm, right? So you, he's developing the kinetic chain. So when I'm saying he has to swing so he has to throw the arm. This is what I think he needs to practice because it's the easiest way to train yourself in the kinetic chain without making it be like painting with numbers. You know what I mean? Where you never quite get it because it's rigid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think him practicing this, the problem is, and I feel like if I show this, I'm just going to put him on blast, but... Just look at this lack of understanding. Like I, he's throwing it, but look how much, like, like what is that? So he well, can, he yeah. should be able, he should be able to, what he needs to be able to do is connect the dots to where. This is a bit throwing, better. Yeah. But it's still a bit ridiculous, right? So he needs to, he needs to kind of find a way to connect the dots between it being a throwing motion, but it's starting to him to feel like it's an actual tennis shot. Yeah, because when to his credit, the first motion, the second motion looked a lot better than the first. <laughs> and way the better. third one is hopefully going to look a lot better than the second. Way so better. that rate of improvement. But you can see here how much better this is than when he's in a match. I agree. 
you know, and this is why I don't spend all the time basket feeding because I want him to feel like there's some pressure because he's got to be able to do this. You know, Just hold down one of those clips so you can see clearly how the hip yeah. walks into the arm. Yeah. And the torso and the arm. Okay. So the hips, uh, the hips are turning at the same time as this racket lags here, which I think is important, right? If you, if you are talking about the exact coordination chain, the hips coinciding with this lay back of the, of the wrist so it can fire, because the hips fire the arm, right? So that, that's, a, that's somewhat of a synchronized move where the hips turn and the, and the wrist and the arm lays back. So basically, well, I kind of talk about leading with the elbow. So the hips turn and you lead with the elbow, the wrist snaps back and then you can, and then you can release. Are you with that synchronization? I'm, I'm agreeing with what you're saying there. Yeah, so the, uh, in time the turn and the throw of the the throw of the elbow, the the wrist will naturally lay back. Like it sometimes seems like in the in the points, he's just creating this nowhere. Like this this racket laying back hasn't happened because the body's turned and the elbow's been thrown, and therefore the wrist lays back. He's just kind of like creating it back here, and then just, and just pulling it. Like it's, it's artificially. Not, it's not part of the stroke. Yeah. It's not happened as a result of the previous things in the chain moving quickly, which lags the racket. He's just kind of lagging it independently, which makes it pretty stiff. Right. And you can just, and then when that happens, you can see how this is like now released through the shot. So in the video, he's kind of doing the, the better swing path, but it's not, it's not released. It's not whipping. The dropping of the racket is still in helper wheels mode, you know, just kind of like teaching the follow through on the forehand for a beginner, right? So you still want them to go through the still full possible range of motion, but you don't want it to happen because you're forcing it. You want yeah. it to happen as part of the swing, kind of like you don't want to force a follow through. You, do, you would never want to force uh, an advanced player to follow through for no reason, right? It's a complete waste of time. Yeah. So once the shot is hit, you don't want him to go over the shoulder and do this and like waste time doing that. No, it should be recovering. Once all the energy is spent from the shot, you're done, right? You're going back and you're recovering. So same way here, you never want to force as an advanced player, you never want to force a specific motion back there. It needs mm. to happen naturally as a result of um, striking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we've got the champion stone skimmer. <laughs> Love High it. elbow, coiling. Oh, turning those hips, leading with the elbow, throwing it. Look at the, look at the follow through. Supinations off the charts, and that wrist. You know what I mean? Like, he just scored a three. Let's watch this again. We'll just, we'll. I'm just gonna play it in slow yeah. motion. All right. So if we go speed. It's a little too slow. Coiling, supinating, releasing. Basically, this guy's got the forehand that Nitsan's dreaming about. Just killing it. So it has very little to do, you know, sometimes Nitsan's like, oh, I'm not flexible enough. It's because you're not, you're not creating the fluidity because when you do that, things stretch, right? You create stretching and things happen naturally. If you're putting yourself in these positions, like if you stand there and try and lead with the elbow, you're like, oh, this is really tough. But if you think about skimming a stone, this old guy here can do it. So I think for me, that's kind of the best. It's good to understand it, but it, you know, when he's out there, he can just think about throwing that racket, throwing it. And I think the other huge issue that he has is he relates it to ripping it. So when he's in practice and he's ripping it, it somewhat happens. Then when he's in a match and he's in grind mode and he's just trying to put it in, he just kind of pushes it. Instead of thinking about it as just a, a throw, if you're throwing a ball or you're skimming a stone, just 
10 feet or something, it's still a throwing motion. It's just a less violent one. It's just a smaller one. Or if you want to throw the ball miles, you know, then you really throw it. But each forehand that he hits should really be a throw of some sort. So then he can regulate how violent he wants to throw the arm and the racket at the ball. Yeah, I mean, I think it's useful to feel your joints move independently before you connect them together. So if you feel that your arm is locked together in a certain motion, then it's helpful to get the joints moving independently first and then see if you can connect a chain that way that has a slight delay one off of each other. I mean, the the biggest challenge for tennis players or anyone that's learning any physical activity, and again, I like to talk about things in concepts, I think is that um, muscle groups tend to be associated together to perform a specific task. And it's a really big challenge for tennis players to disassociate those movements and create new associations, right? Because the, the muscle groups work together. Let's say you're picking up a gallon of milk. There's a ton of muscles that work together to do that. And you don't necessarily think about it. But it's, it, right? I think what you're all saying is like, if we think about uh, Shreya, this other girl that I teach, she has a relationship with the shoulder, right? Like you can tell that she's built up this relationship with the shoulder. So trying to, focus your attention on something else is tricky and um, what you're saying is, is useful right to focus your attention on a different body part because if you just play the whole shot you'll always just use the thing that you've kind of built up this uh, you know you, you use it more than everything else but right. I, I do think that taking it out of tennis like to skim in a stone or doing something like that can just get you to use different muscles and think about it a little differently. Right. Um, that's exactly what I'm saying. And even without any activity, just feel your joint move independently. Like it's really tough for people to, um, you know, let's say grab the gallon of milk, but only use the wrist or something like that, or only the elbow or only the shoulder, right? It's very unnatural for people to do things differently, but it builds that awareness and you don't even have to move an object, just move your arm and just understand how your body works and build some awareness. And so when you step out on the tennis court, you have a better physical understanding of the sequence of events that needs to happen, like the chain of events that needs to happen for you to actually accentuate that striking point or striking zone. Yeah. I think it's just a, a lot of it is about discovery as well. Now, how we go about teaching that is can be, you know, debate and can be, can have different style and flavor from instructor to instructor. But I think that that concept um, is there it needs to happen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. don't forget man <laughs> this book right here elite tennis this one if you want to have fun and laugh this one if you want to learn how to be the greatest tennis player ever <laughs>